Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. The word for the night is hope. Finally, there is some new hope. I will talk about many things from normal aging related memory changes to Alzheimer's disease and the spectrum between normal and Alzheimer's disease and give you some insights about the newly approved FDA treatment referred to as aducanumab, the first medication in 18 years to be approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot to unpack about that. There's a lot of controversy, and we'll talk a bit about that. But as we go through the talk, I want to start with giving you an overview. I'm going to tell you about the history of Alzheimer's disease. What is normal aging, by the way? since that's one of the most common questions people ask, is this normal when I can't remember something? Mild cognitive impairment, a term that's important to understand because it has implications for some of the newer therapy. And moving forward, part of what we want to understand is what does mild cognitive impairment truly imply? Alzheimer's disease, the terrible condition for which so many of you watching have family members affected, know somebody who's been affected, or our caregivers. And a special thank you to all you caregivers out there. We know how hard it must be. Thanks to you, thanks to my colleagues who help educate, including physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, neuropsychologists, social workers. It's an endless number of people fighting hard against this terrible disease. But we do have some hope, I assure you. Prevention and treatment. Everyone wants to know how to prevent it. Everyone knows what, wants to know how you might treat this disease. And some of the latest updates. That's where it's starting to get truly exciting. It's the first time in 25 years I've been able to say that. The history of Alzheimer's disease dates back to 1906, when the person for which this name came, Alois Alzheimer, reports the case of pre-senile dementia in a woman he studied in Germany. He was born in 1864 in Germany. He wrote his dissertation, believe it or not, on the wax-producing glands of the ear. That was an era where you did more than look into the ears. Physicians at the time covered all kinds of specialties. There wasn't yet a true separation of psychiatry from neurology. He first worked in a mental asylum in Frankfurt, Germany, where he encountered his first patient. I learned just this past weekend from a specialist that they took evidence from her time, and they actually were able to take her DNA and found out that she had a family mutation, one of the more common mutations in Alzheimer's disease. Technology applied over 100 years ago confirmed that just recently. So he focused on trying to separate the various forms of dementia using an underlying uh, detailed pathology. Dementia, sometimes patients will say to me, well, my loved one, has dementia but not Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's but not dementia. Uh, dementia, so you understand, is a condition as a general term. Under the term dementia is Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common form of dementia, and we'll talk about that in more detail. But just to define the term, dementia means loss of ability to carry out activities of daily living and impairment in multiple spheres of your cognitive ability. What Alzheimer wrote in 1898 was that pre-senile dementia is distinguished from the common senile dementia by pre-existing feebleness of the intellect and the earlier appearance of senile feeble-mindedness and from paralysis by its long, slow course and lack of the characteristic physical symptoms of paralysis. What he was saying was stroke when he said paralysis, differences between stroke and dementia, a cognitive disorder. It was 1910 when his name was applied by another physician who knew him. He was apparently a very humble man and would never have named the disease for himself. The senium, the aging, the, cha the words change over time. Nowadays, it might be thought a bit of an insult if someone said, you're senile. It shouldn't, but it carries a different connotation these days, so we don't tend to say that anymore. But it was felt to begin at age 60 until 1887. 65 became the dividing point when old age insurance was introduced in Germany. In 1940, 
McMenemy discouraged thinking of Alzheimer's disease only in terms of age because the pathology can be seen at multiple ages. Later, 20th century plaques and tangles, they get better defined, and these are understood as the key features of Alzheimer's disease. Normal aging, quite variable for physical and cognitive function. We all know the spectrum is broad for who does well and who doesn't do so well with age. It depends on genetics, it depends on environment, heavily dependent upon our own lifestyle and life choices. By age 20, sadly, we start to lose brain cells and important chemicals for brain function. Short-term and remote memories are usually not affected by aging so much, but the recent memory, something that just happened recently, forgetting the name of someone who you recently met, pretty darn common. Trouble coming up with a word temporarily is common. That's not a sign of dementia. It's just a sign of getting older. And in normal aging, there shouldn't be a significant impact on your daily function. For those of us, including myself and my brother, who've now started to forget things as we get into our mid-50s and up, we can laugh about it and say, well, that's what my patients say to me. They're forgetting things. And we know, or we hope, that we're still in the normal range because it's funny and frustrating when you can't remember something and you're laughing with friends. In the normal aging stage, you laugh. It's not so funny later if it progresses, but all of us have that funny experience among our friends. Case example, a 55-year-old businesswoman has been concerned about her memory for the past six months. She's under a great deal of stress at work and has been having difficulties coming up with the names of recent clients. She occasionally misplaces objects at her home. Her mother had Alzheimer's at age 80, and consequently, she's concerned that she may be developing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. This would be a very common presentation to our office. On neurologic exam, everything seems normal. Neuropsychological testing falls in the average or normal range. The brain MRI looks good. All the screening laboratory studies that we do, they look good. In other words, this is a person who's worried, but she's well. She has no significant memory problem and should be reassured that she can be followed clinically. We don't dismiss the issues because we can't know definitively if this might be the very first sign of something. But as of now, that's not enough to make us say you need to worry. A lot of times it's practical issues. I know from my colleagues in the world of occupational therapy and speech therapy, they talk a lot about controlling the environment. Don't multitask, do one thing at a time. Keep a list, keep one calendar, not three calendars. Various terms have been applied to this normal aging, ranging from benign senescent forgetfulness to age-associated memory impairment, age-associated cognitive decline, and late-life forgetfulness. We are often more aware of this than our friends, which is a generally good sign of the relatively benign nature of our concerns. If we move to the next category, it's mild cognitive impairment, this is meant to refer to an abnormal process, likely the early stages of a dementing condition, and as such, is fundamentally different from the extremes of normal aging. About 12 to 18 percent among non-demented subjects aged 65 or greater, somewhat lower when the entire population is considered. In other words, a large number of people after age 65 start falling into this category. It's about 1% per year after age 65, people who fall in this category. It was originally defined to predict a pre-Alzheimer's state, but not all patients with mild cognitive impairment develop Alzheimer's disease. There was a consensus conference in 2003 to define this a little bit better, and this table shows you how that was categorized. You start with a person coming with a cognitive complaint, and if it's not normal for age, they're not experiencing dementia. There's a cognitive decline, but essentially normal functional activities. The person still takes care of most things pretty well. That's called mild cognitive impairment. And then it's subdivided into these other categories, 
which I won't go into into detail because they aren't really pertinent to us at the moment, but they're divided there if you're interested in these different forms of mild cognitive impairment. There's really no absolute rules or tests to prove someone has mild cognitive impairment. It's still based on the clinical judgment of the physician as well as the neuropsychologist doing the testing. We can categorize based on the findings, based on the cognitive testing that we do. Here's an example of a kind of common presentation we might see. A 68-year-old retired teacher has been becoming increasingly forgetful over the past year. Although the demands on this man have been reduced in retirement, he's still having difficulty recalling details of events. He is impaired in trying to recall important information, such as doctor's appointments, luncheon engagements, golf tea times with friends. His family has been noting that he is forgetting information that he formerly would not have forgotten. That's a helpful bit of information when I ask family members and caregivers, is this something he would have already done if not, we get a little more concerned. If we do testing, may make some errors in our testing, may forget three words given earlier, may forget the day of the week. Remainder of the exam is probably normal most of the, most of the time. Uh, not depressed, it's important to check about how someone feels because if you are experiencing depression or anxiety, that can certainly lead to memory changes. MRI scan showing mild atrophy. That means some loss of volume of tissue in the brain, and specifically in an area called the hippocampus or the hippocampal formation. Those are mildly affected, but the rest of the brain, pretty normal. The importance of the hippocampus we'll talk about. The neuropsychological testing was notable only for trouble learning new material and some impairment in delayed recall. Most likely, this is someone who has amnestic MCI. Amnestic means predominantly a memory loss form of mild cognitive impairment. There's a slowly progressive memory problem with otherwise unremarkable cognitive impairment, and he does not have significant functional impairment, can function in life still fairly well. That's the reason he does not meet the criteria for dementia. This may represent the earliest stages of a degenerative disorder, such as Alzheimer's, but it doesn't prove that he will or will not get the disease at some point. Now, what about the course of this? It's the, one of the more common questions we experience and talk about in the office. If it's degenerative, the causes are usually gradual onset, sort of an insidious, slow progression. That's a fairly typical degenerative. And we use the word degenerative to imply that cells are dying at a rate faster than they should. Alzheimer's is an example of a degenerative cognitive disorder. Vascular mild cognitive impairment usually is attributable to blood flow related issues, such as you might see with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, history of TIAs. TIAs are warnings for strokes, transient ischemic attacks, or strokes themselves. And often there can be an abrupt onset in the setting of a stroke. So that history is important for us to obtain. If there's a history of depression or depressed mood or anxiety, that might be part of the problem. There are medical conditions that can contribute. These can include congestive heart failure, systemic cancer with or without chemotherapy or radiation, kidney failure, diabetes, all of these can contribute to impairment in cognition. Amnestic mild cognitive impairment of a degenerative cause, when we think it's not from those other categories, but we think it's a degenerative process, that progresses to dementia, usually Alzheimer's, at a rate of about 10 to 15% per year. If there is Alzheimer's disease pathology, meaning special imaging that shows buildup of amyloid or blood tests or spinal fluid, suspicious for early Alzheimer's disease markers, then that rate goes up to about a 35% per year range. And that'll become particularly pertinent as we move forward in this talk. And that's a lot about what happened in the new medication for Alzheimer's. That's how we started thinking, well, maybe we have something here we could try. This compares to the population incidence figures for Alzheimer's disease of about one to 2% per year. 
as opposed to individuals who have the mild cognitive impairment already. A small percentage will improve, and some will remain stable for years, but that's not most patients. How do you predict if there might be some progression? Well, if it's fairly prominent, that's a sign it may progress. If the volume of the hippocampus, an MRI structure, is small, that's a sign that it might progress. APOE, that is a genetic abnormality. We all carry APOE, but if you have APOE4 carrier, meaning one of your chromosomes or two of your chromosomes has APOE4, that's a significantly increased risk of getting worse over time. If you have an abnormal PET scan showing buildup of amyloid, it's called an FDG PET scan or an amyloid PET scan. Spinal fluid markers, they're proteins called tau and beta amyloid. Those are measurable. If those are elevated, that, that suggests you're at higher risk of progressing. And amyloid on the PET scans is a key marker. Tau imaging as well. So patients with more severe memory loss and multiple domains of mild cognitive impairment tend to progress faster than those with just the amnestic form and less severe memory loss. This comes out of detailed testing. It's hard to pick up in a simple office visit, but this is why we often refer for neuropsychological testing. It's highly effective at helping to subdivide individuals into relatively predictable categories, although that's not always perfect. It's a very good measure. Atrophy, the loss of cells and mass of brain in the hippocampus, increases the likelihood of progression. Subjective and quantitative assessments are valid. They've been proven to be so. Here's where I'm talking about these structures. The hippocampus, that's H-I-P-P, -P, that's a normal full area of tissue right there. Just look at this area and there's not much dark where spinal fluid is. This is a full structure. Similarly on that side. And the parahippocampal gyrus, PHG, is right here. This is the normal one. Now, this person who has mild cognitive impairment and eventually converted to Alzheimer's disease, see how much dark there is here and how much less of the hippocampus there is? Look there, lots of dark, not dark there. Lots of structure here, not so much there. This parahippocampal gyrus, small strip, it's thicker there. That's what I'm referring to when talking about the hippocampus and that structure. APOE carrier status, a well-known predictor of developing Alzheimer's disease. It's a predictor of conversion from MCI to Alzheimer's disease. What does this substance normally do? Well, it's a carrier of cholesterol and lipids in the blood and in the brain and spinal fluid. It also transports beta amyloid. There are various types. There's the rare form type 2. The most common is epsilon 3 and epsilon 4. 15 to 20% of the population carry this. This is the one that increases your risk significantly for Alzheimer's disease. The 1 to 2% of individuals who are homozygous, meaning you have a copy from mom and a copy from dad, there's a 50% risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in the mid to late 70s. Now, sometimes people say, well, should we test this? Should we know if I carry this or not? And the answer is, it, it depends. And why are we doing it? What are we accomplishing with it? Because of the lack, historically, of specific therapy and ability to predict which individuals will convert to Alzheimer's disease, the American Academy of Neurology does not currently recommend routine testing of the APOE4 status. So yes, you can get it, and yes, you can get it on your own. You don't have to have a physician. You can go online, order it, get it done. Last I looked, it's about 79 bucks to find out. Imaging techniques for mild cognitive impairment. MRI is something we always like to use because it gives us great detail. But we're looking for other causes of an impairment. Sometimes we can find things unexpected that explain why someone's having a decline in their memory. PET scan is a different form of imaging. It's not so much the structure, but it's looking at metabolic activity or substances in the brain with various markers. It's generally valid and helpful. You can look at glucose, you can look at amyloid, you can look at tau, 
and synapse markers. These are all simply proteins for which you can image. We don't tend to do this regularly in our clinical practice. It tends to be done in large university programs. Scans aren't easy to get when it comes to PET scans. That's probably going to change a bit in the future, but that is the current status of them. It's not considered mandatory or necessary for the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease yet, but this is a slide from last year, and the yet is changed now to it may very well be. It's expensive, five, $6,000 probably, not widely available. That's still generally true, particularly the amyloid scans. You can get a PET scan, but the amyloid form is very hard to get. Other labeling techniques, looking at different markers, that's all still developing and clinical research ongoing. The pathology of memory loss associated or amnestic mild cognitive impairment it's generally the same as that of Alzheimer's. So when you look in the brain, you'll still see neuritic plaques. You'll see neurofibrillary tangles. These are the structures and abnormalities you see in the brains of individuals with Alzheimer's, but it's still a part of normal aging as well. It's just the volume is less in mild cognitive impairment than you see in Alzheimer's. So because of that, some people argue that this is Alzheimer's disease because the vast majority of patients develop the clinical features eventually. However, there are some cases of other dementias, such as dementia with Lewy bodies, a different form of dementia, or frontotemporal dementia, or progressive supranuclear palsy or vascular dementia that start with amnestic MCI. In other words, just because they have some pathology suggesting it might become Alzheimer's, they don't all become that. That's been the dilemma. Now, Alzheimer's disease itself. It is the most common form of dementia worldwide. In the United States, that number of 4.5 million now is up to about 6 million. The incidence doubles every five years after the age of 60. Estimated prevalence of about 14 million by 2050 in the US and about 100 million worldwide. You can see the impact is going to be tremendous. It's the most common cause of nursing home placement. It costs about $140 billion a year. If we could just delay onset or functional deterioration by one to two years, the cost savings would be tremendous. So what happens in Alzheimer's disease? That atrophy, that loss of tissue begins in the hippocampus and it spreads to affect all other areas of the cortex, which means the surface level of the brain, that's where the neurons live, except for the occipital lobe, that's in the back of your head, that's where the vision is stored. Occipital lobe pathology doesn't really occur in Alzheimer's disease to any significant degree. Individuals don't lose vision with that disease. Under a microscope, you see a loss of neurons. Amyloid plaques are evident. That's deposits of amyloid in the blood vessels. Neurofibrillary tangles, that's abnormal tau proteins. They're inside of cells. And these are the principal features described 100 years ago by Alzheimer. That principal description has not changed. It's still the main hallmark of this disease under a microscope. It isn't as simple as just that. There's a cascade of events that's theorized to lead to Alzheimer's disease, starting with Inflammation, inflammation matters, and free radical formation. What are free radicals? Well, these are species of molecules that cause damage inside of the body and specifically within cells. The neurotransmitter acetylcholine, that's the chemical that you need to function with memory and many other functions in the brain. That decreases significantly with others declining later in the disease such as glutamate, noradrenaline, serotonin. These are all connectors between nerves. If you can't move from one nerve to the next and have them communicate, you're gonna have some degree of impairment. The synapses, those are the connections between a neuron and the next neuron down the chain. Those are reduced. The volume and distribution of these plaques and tangles define the disease pathology, where they are and their volumes. But some normal, older individuals have the pathology 
without symptoms of the disease. This is one of the tricky parts. Truly, individuals can have all of the pathologic hallmarks of full-blown Alzheimer's disease seen at autopsy and not have symptoms when they were alive. We don't know exactly why that is. What is the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? It's age. The prevalence is 1% to 2% at age 65, 15% of the population by 75, and 40% by 85, and up to 50% of patients in their 90s. Family history, about 20% of patients have one or more siblings or parents who are affected. Some mutations in genes cause the inherited or familial forms. That's only about 1% of all cases. It's more common in women, and we're not sure why, but that's the case. Estrogen replacement may actually increase the risk. Some of that's uncertain. Increased education and exercise are associated with a lower risk. More religious and spiritual individuals seem to have a lower risk. Anti-inflammatory medicines like Advil, we thought they might be protective. That is no longer thought to be the case. That's been studied thoroughly, and we don't encourage people to take those medicines for that purpose. Diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obesity, factors that lead to vascular disease, those all increase the risk of developing the disease at some point. So this diagnosis is based on impaired memory and other cognitive impairment that's gradual. You don't suddenly become demented. You don't suddenly get Alzheimer's disease. If it's a sudden change, then it's not Alzheimer's disease. It's probably something else. But it's gradual and it's progressive. It impairs function with no other identifiable causes. It's our responsibility as physicians to determine if there's any other explanation. It can't be diagnosed in the setting of an acute confusional state or what we call a delirium. So in other words, if someone comes in after having had intoxication or head trauma from an automobile accident and they're acutely agitated or confused, we can never make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's at that point because we have to wait for that acute confusional state to clear to determine if they might have underlying dementia. The pathologic criteria usually confirm the diagnosis at autopsy, but not always. In other words, we may think someone has Alzheimer's disease, and at autopsy, we're wrong about 10 or 12% of the time. They'll have pathology that's different. The most important aspect of this is the history. What is the story? That's what I need to know. That's what any provider needs to know when we're learning about a patient's experience and what family has noticed. It's often unreliable from a patient. It is not unusual at all for the patient to say, the only reason I'm here in the office is because she said I have to come. I'm fine. And you can imagine how often there's a little bit of contention there. But family or friends can usually provide the key information. I have to be able to get their input. And sometimes that's separate. If it's going to lead to escalation of tension in the exam room, we simply don't go there. And sometimes the family members will want to tell me, and I'll try to kindly say, I understand, or I'll give them a nod or a wink and say, I get it. Let's get some time privately, because you may not want to upset your loved one. Because it's very distressing, very distressing to have someone speak about your impairment when you're able to at least understand what they're implying. The key information for making this diagnosis Insidious onset, gradual, short-term memory loss. Repetitive conversations, they keep telling you similar things, the same story repeatedly. Language difficulties, coming up with words, some trouble expressing oneself, getting lost while driving or in a parking lot. Trouble with the checkbook, finances, bills are built up, you're getting calls you never got before from collection agencies. Trouble following a recipe or planning a trip, something that requires multiple steps, something that is referred to from frontal lobe dysfunction as executive function. If you can't carry out a series of events in an organized fashion, that's an impairment that is not unusual in Alzheimer's. Behavioral disturbances, fairly common as the illness progresses. Apathy is very common. 
people say, well, he just doesn't go out to the wood shop anymore. He doesn't, he doesn't want to do it anymore. He won't go out with his buddies and play golf. He says, I don't feel like it. 30% with depression in the early stages. It is depressing to know you're losing your memory. Not surprisingly, we often withdraw. Anxiety when alone or forced to interact in large groups. Those can be very difficult situations for individuals experiencing Alzheimer's disease. As the disease progresses, stages of paranoia can occur. Delusional misinterpretations are fairly common. Feeling one's spouse is being unfaithful, feeling people are going after your money. Those are sad, frustrating situations that arise commonly. 75% get agitated as the disease progresses. Can be verbally and physically aggressive, usually with those who surround them. That's family and caregivers. Disinhibition in the form of jokes or sexual behavior they would never have done before. So the physical and neurologic exam helps primarily to exclude the other conditions that may mimic the disease. Laboratory tests and imaging we do primarily exclude these other potential causes. Somewhere in the range of 10 to 20% of the time, we may find something like a stroke or a tumor or bleeding. But they're also now starting to allow the diagnosis to be a little more certain. This includes blood and spinal fluid tests we can do that are supportive of the disease, as well as this amyloid PET scanning, which is gonna become more common. Formal neuropsychological testing. These are PhD, typically, specialists in neurocognitive dysfunction. Testing is very helpful. It helps to subdivide groups, see if categories are more or less in favor of Alzheimer's versus some other source of dementia or memory loss. Now, prevention and treatment. What everyone wants to know, how do we prevent? How do we treat? Mild cognitive impairment, there were no FDA-approved treatments last year. But now, with aducanumab, newly approved as of June, there may be a it may be appropriate to consider with proper biomarkers to suggest high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, what does that mean? That means in an individual who has mild cognitive impairment, of which 80% of the individuals in the studies for this medication called aducanumab or aduhelm, uh, which is its brand name, 80% of the people in that study had mild cognitive impairment, but they had markers of Alzheimer's disease. They had an abnormal amyloid PET scan, and a percentage had abnormal spinal fluid results, suggestive of the type of protein abnormality we see in Alzheimer's disease, specifically um, A-beta protein, a form of amyloid. So that's the new change compared to just a year ago. It may be appropriate to test individuals with mild cognitive impairment for these markers to see if they might fall into the category of individuals for which the clinical trial studied and found borderline improvements to no improvement. And I'll go into that in more detail, but that's a taste of what's coming when it comes to a discussion about this new molecule. Most attention has been on the amnestic form of mild cognitive impairment, the form that may very well move toward Alzheimer's disease. Things that have been done, including vitamin E, Aricept or Dinepazil, Rivastigmine, Galantamine, these are medications that increase acetylcholine, and other medicines like the anti-inflammatory Vioxx, they were all negative in mild cognitive impairment, except a slight delay in the process when we used the um, Aricept to slow down the conversion towards Alzheimer's disease. But at 36 months, it didn't matter. So pretty borderline to no benefits. So what do we say to you when we say you have mild cognitive impairment? Well, it all depends on the risk factors present and one's acceptance of risk. It's an important time to plan for the future, including financial issues, retirement, living arrangements. If we throw in mild cognitive impairment with markers suggesting high risk of conversion to Alzheimer's disease, we may want to consider this aducanumab molecule. 
and you'll want to potentially have this information so you can be fully informed and make an informed decision. Being physically and intellectually engaged at any stage of life is critical. Eating healthy, that means hit the Mediterranean diet predominantly, fruits, vegetables, limited red meats, limited processed foods, and only going to Wendy's once a month, maybe. Keep your eyes open for new therapies. That's exactly what I said last year. Well, the new therapy's here, and we're going to keep talking about it. Alzheimer's disease prevention and treatment. All current therapies are primarily for symptomatic cases and to help symptoms, focused on cognitive and behavioral symptoms. That's what therapies are based on. Can you help cognition, help behavior? None have been proven to delay biological progression of disease until this recently approved molecule called aducanumab, which reduces amyloid volume. This is irrefutable. It significantly decreases the volume of amyloid in the brain. And you would think, and the hope would have been, if you lower that volume of amyloid, then individuals should do better or have their disease slow down. And what happened in 2019, two clinical studies, both through Biogen, the pharmaceutical company, were halted at 18 months due to futility. They were not shown to be effective. There were individuals whose charge was to decide if the study should continue, if there was efficacy to prove that this was effective. And the answer was, it appears not to be effective in the clinical measures, meaning caregiver recognition of changes or physician recognition of changes on objective measures of cognitive function. Both studies were ceased. That changed, and I'll tell you what happened, but initially that was what occurred. Then subsections of one of the studies were looked at in more detail, and the individuals who received the high volume of the infusion measured in weight, 10 milligram per kilogram dose of this particular infusion. This is an IV infusion given every month, assuming you meet criteria, but individuals got every month an infusion. And a small number of them had a little bit of a slowdown in their decline. And what do I mean by a little bit of a slowdown? Compared to the individuals who weren't treated, it was slowed down by about four months. Most people react and say, what do you mean it was slowed down by four months? Is that all? And the answer is yes, that's what's been shown so far. That was the clinical benefit, slowed things down before you were at the same level by about four months. Well, is that enough to justify using it? It depends. The FDA advisory panel made up of experts in the field at the time voted unanimously to not approve this molecule. This was in November of last year. Then the FDA took that information and said, we are going to approve it anyway based on the fact that scientifically it lowers amyloid, which is encouraging and can lead to possible improvements in some individuals. And we are gonna put it into a status of accelerated improval, which means a phase four study is recommended to be performed by the manufacturer to look and see what happens once it's on the market. Once it's on the market, its labeling says it can be used in Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't say anything else. It doesn't say you have to have testing. It doesn't say anything other than it is available for use in Alzheimer's disease if felt to be appropriate by the physician and the patient. And that led to a firestorm. And if you want to read interesting articles and editorials, I recommend you read pieces from the New York Times. Very good research on that. You'll find all kinds of information because it's a very interesting and productive debate to have probably as an entire society. This affects all of us. Why does it affect all of us? Because we have some tough decisions to make. 
This molecule currently is being priced at approximately $56,000 per year. When a group of unbiased individuals said, well, what is it worth for its relative benefit, they suggested it should be priced anywhere from $3,500 to $8,000 per year. But it's not currently at that price. That, that is the current most recently suggested price. Medicare has not ruled formally on this. Many, many insurers have not ruled on this. They haven't said they're going to cover it. Some have. Some have said they won't. Some major institutions have considered whether they want to even provide it as an option. Some have said yes. Some have said no. We as a practice here in Boulder haven't made any formal decision. We're still thinking about how to do this. But more than likely, this is going to be about education and talking to all of you and saying, here's what the data shows. It's not convincing yet. Do you believe this might be worth trying for yourself or a family member? That's the discussion I anticipate us having. Most of the beneficial effects of the current therapies are mild at best. And I would put aducanumab in that category as well. Mild at best. Still appropriate to consider. And we can debate that, but it is still appropriate to talk about it. Perhaps in MCI and mild cases of Alzheimer's disease, that's where aducanumab was tested. It was not tested in moderate to severe Alzheimer's. Those studies have already been done, and those were not shown to be effective in the past. Though so the FDA approved drugs for Alzheimer's include Aricept, Razidine, Exelon, and Namenda, and now the aducanumab. The Aricept, Razidine, Exelon, those increase acetylcholine. We still use them, and we will still consider using them. Namenda blocks something called NMDA. That can help protect neurons. These have some impact and mild improvement on cognition and some functions of life, sometimes helpful in behavior and moderate and even advanced Alzheimer's disease. They can be somewhat helpful. But any of you who have treated or been with someone going through Alzheimer's disease, you know these drugs don't make a major impact. Similar for Namenda, a mild impact. Vitamin E, we thought it might work. Not much of an effect at this point. Ongoing clinical trials. There are many, many medicines in the anti-amyloid pipeline. Stay tuned. They're going to keep coming. I think we're going to get something. It feels as if it will happen, and there are strong reasons to believe that. Whether it's against amyloid or another protein, that's where the research is focused right now as predominant for treatment of, um, effects. Several failed, but we're still moving forward. Aducanumab is the one that might be the first to show some benefit. Amyloid vaccination studies those were abandoned because they created too much of an inflammatory reaction. So those were stopped because of inflammation in the brain. Treatment of behavioral symptoms, that becomes a major focus and it's a major challenge. There aren't any approved treatments for agitation, hallucinations, or delusions. We use things off-label. We use medications typically used in psychiatry for mood disorders. And we try them when appropriate. A very nice, consistent environment is what we want. The atypical antipsychotics, that's what I'm referring to. They have various names, but they're used for delusions, hallucinations, mood swings. Some risk of stroke, increased risk of death with these medications, that's a fact. We still use them because the alternative isn't really acceptable. We can treat some depression with medicines like Prozac. We can sometimes use antidepressants for anxiety and obsessive behaviors and occasionally drugs like Ativan, which is like Valium. A lot of side effects in older patients. We have to be careful. And same with not sleeping. We use a variety of options there. When is the beginning of this disease? Well, there was what's called the Religious Order Study, 1994, and the Rush Memory and Aging Project, 1997 looked at 2,000 individuals originally free of dementia. No one had any evidence of dementia. And initially, similar declines in those who ultimately developed Alzheimer's disease and those who didn't. In other words, normal aging seemed to be happening in both groups. 
65 months before Alzheimer's was diagnosed, the rates of declines are 15 times faster. In other words, for those individuals who are moving towards Alzheimer's disease, 65 months before it was diagnosed, their decline goes 15 times faster. So if you have that pathology, you're gonna decline far faster. So combining that mild cognitive impairment data, that suggests that there may be a 10-year decline before Alzheimer's is even diagnosed. Now that's the old day. Maybe we're moving to a new era. That's when we might take mild cognitive impairment, do these tests and say, hey, no more waiting. Let's consider an intervention. The new criteria consider preclinical stage. That's where we are now. Even looking at blood, spinal fluid, or PET scan, we may see changes suggesting even before symptoms develop that you may have a predisposition. Really tricky to know who we should test and is it appropriate? That's to be debated and that's its own long discussion. Mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, that would be the category where we see pathology changes in addition to the cognitive complaints where you may very well have Alzheimer's disease, you just haven't changed enough to meet the clinical diagnosis of the disease yet. And then the full-blown dementia stage where you are functionally impaired. That's where it seems for the most part to be a bit late. The disease has a continuum of the preclinical state, the early and full-blown stages. We really want to figure out who with mild cognitive impairment will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. But now we've got the biomarkers and we can look and this can help us. The changing research approaches include doing these tests, looking for amyloid, looking for tau. These are proteins we can test for. And earlier treatment, now a consideration. So more attention to prevention, early education of our children, letting people know you should eat healthy from the time you're 10 forward. And even as a baby, it probably matters. A lifetime of good health, a lifetime of engagement, a lifetime of intellectual achievement, a lifetime of limited alcohol and drugs, it pays off. I'm gonna skip through the ideas study. Um, you can read that, but it is information about why we want to have PET scanning available. So my summary, forgetfulness is common in normal individuals with age. It just happens to us. When there's impaired short-term memory alone or with mild impairment, other areas of cognition, that does not cause significant functional impairment, then MCI should be considered. This is the middle ground. Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed when there is functional impairment. The individual has lost the ability to function fully in the setting of memory loss and other cognitive impairment. And now we can throw in, if you have pathology on an amyloid PET scan or in spinal fluid or in your blood, you may very well have Alzheimer's disease even before you have major functional impairment. We always wanna to try to find reversible and treatable causes. There are no good treatments for MCI still, but we still consider these new options and where are we headed? We're headed in the right direction. These approved therapies for Alzheimer's disease have mild effects in most cases, including the aducanumab, it's mild. We need much better prevention and treatment for the diseases that take away what makes us human, what makes us thrive. That's what we want to sustain. I thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. I know we won't be able to get to all of the questions that are coming up, but please know that neurologists are out there to help you, and a lot of discussion can be held in my office or any other neurologist's office about this issue. We're all learning a lot, and we're gonna get up to speed as a community throughout Boulder region and throughout the United States. Truly stay tuned, because the breakthroughs have just begun, and they're going to continue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zacharias. That was very informational. To our audience, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat box below the video. We've already received some of those. Um, I'm gonna dive into those and we'll see how many we can get through in about the next 10 minutes or so. 
Um, what chemicals are lost starting at age 20 that affect the brain? Can supplements replace them? Sure, so many different neurotransmitters um, change over time. At a young age, you don't notice any of that normally. But what would change is your relative production of acetylcholine. You start to develop atrophy even in your 20s. And we atrophy in our brain at a very small rate, under 1% per year, but it's already starting. So you're gonna lose some of those chemicals like acetylcholine over time. How much does alcohol abuse affect MCI? Can stopping drinking improve your cha chances of having your brain return to normal? Yes, I'll talk about that, and then I forgot to finish on the first question. The person asked, oh, what, sorry. what about um, anything you can do about it? Um, the supplement world is a little uncertain. Um, Probably the best thing you can do is eat the Mediterranean-based diet. That's what's shown to be the most likely to prevent people who have memory impairment from developing Alzheimer's disease. So hit those vegetables, hit those fruits, limit the meat, a plant-based diet, healthy grains, healthy oils. When it comes to supplements, no supplements are proven to be effective. They could have minimal impact, perhaps, but because they're so poorly regulated, it's hard to know definitively, and we don't yet have a set of supplements we know to be effective. They're typically not harmful, but always be careful and talk to your provider when it comes to making a choice like that. Now, when it comes to the alcohol issue, alcohol has some protective effects in small doses when it comes to protecting you from heart attack and stroke. The volume of alcohol consumption that's considered potentially helpful is about one to two drinks in a man and one drink in a woman. And those mean not big drinks, means standard size, an ounce of alcohol, a 12 ounce beer, six ounces of wine. It's not very much. As soon as you start exceeding that, the potential consequences outweigh the potential benefits. And if you cease alcohol, very rapidly, many of those processes are improved. And individuals who drink a lot often don't eat, eat very well, so getting on a healthier diet can be a big part of that recovery as well. So we don't tell people to drink for their health, but for individuals who do drink, we say that's fine, just be careful and know that if you do drink, you have some protections for heart attack and stroke, but if you exceed it on a consistent basis, you're probably doing more harm than good. What is the name of the test to get online that you mentioned for $79? Oh, that's called the APOE4 gene type. There are many different sites. If you put in APOE4 testing or APOE testing, you'll see many will pop up. It's not hard to find on the internet. Okay, thank you for that. That was a technical name. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were many uh, people that ask if uh, you've been diagnosed or you're having uh, some of these symptoms, how long is the lifespan expected? The lifespan after diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is highly dependent upon a couple of factors. Uh, the factors are what is your age at diagnosis and what are your other coexisting illnesses. So as you would guess, an individual with many medical problems is not going to likely live as long as someone who is healthy. But let's take, for example, the more common, few common illnesses, maybe some high blood pressure, maybe a little bit of elevated cholesterol, but all well controlled, otherwise healthy, and even extremely healthy, like so many people in Boulder. Um, the lifespan, approximately, after diagnosis, time of death, is average around six to eight years. Okay. Um, again, there have been several questions asking if a particular uh, drug may accelerate or even cause uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, there's one here about a cancer drug, but then there's been some other uh, questions with this as well. Can you address that, please? Sure. It's, a, it's broad, but... Um 
I'll talk about the ones that come up most frequently, um, to, particularly recently. One question people have asked is, if I take a statin, one of the most commonly prescribed groups of drugs, statins are things like Lipitor, uh, generics called atorvastatin, but anything that ends in statin is a medicine to help lower cholesterol. And we prescribe them all the time to prevent strokes and heart attacks. And historically, there have been some debates of whether statin drugs increase your risk of memory loss or dementia. And the current answer, after most recent publications, is it does not seem to cause people to get dementia. There are still debates. There are still research being done. But some very careful work out of the University of California has recently said we should not discourage the use of statins as of now for people who need them. And certainly, you don't want to be on them if you don't need them. But if you have an indication for a statin to prevent your risk of heart attack and stroke, feel comfortable that you are not causing yourself to be demented. The second one for which we would be more cautious is a group of drugs called benzodiazepines. That's Valium and every other drug like it. Most of those drugs end in PAM, diazepam and lorazepam and temazepam. All of these drugs have been used for decades to help people rest, anxiety, most commonly for anxiety and sleep. They aren't overtly dangerous, but the evidence suggests that these medications, benzodiazepines, do increase your risk of developing dementia. So when possible, stay off of them. If you need them, don't feel that you're doing the wrong thing. If you have a profound anxiety disorder and you've benefited from them for years, don't feel guilty. Have a discussion with your doctor prescribing them, whether it's a psychiatrist or primary care. The information isn't to scare you. It's just to let you know it seems to increase your risk of dementia. As far as other drugs go, chemotherapy, drugs that are neurotoxic, um, they may contribute to your cognitive impairment. And we don't think of them necessarily as causing Alzheimer's, but they may contribute. And similar things have come up with the idea of aluminum and heavy metals. These things may contribute. So the fewer neurotoxins you can be exposed to, logically, the better. But if you have cancer and you need chemotherapy, it's worth getting treated. And knowing there could be cognitive impairment later, that's the sad reality of treating with toxic drugs. Thank you. What about the impact of stress on memory? Well, I can assure you that it isn't good. And I know that if I'm stressed, and all of you out there, you know if you're stressed, you aren't doing your best. It's very impactful, particularly at the moment you're doing any testing. So if you're under very high stress, as people are in the office, or if you're going to do a formal test, you may score below the level you normally would when you're relaxed. And I recognize that, and therapists recognize that. So it just gives us some insights. Now, as far as the impact of stress and having stress hormones released, sure, they have some negative impacts. That by itself won't cause you to have dementia, but it will cause you to do less well when you're communicating and speaking and as much as possible, yes, we all want to be less stressed. Mindfulness, calming, anything you can do to stay in a calmer state means you're going to function at a better level. OK. Probably this will have to be our last, maybe one more question after this. We'll see. Uh, there were quite a few uh, people that had specifics, but I'll ask it in a general way. And it has to do with the impact of family history and when you might need to start getting tested or being aware of that. Um, uh, and so if you have any words to the wise to that, that would be appreciated by quite a few of our audience here. It is a common question. And some of it depends upon what age the onset was in a family member. I know, for example, in a family where let's say your parent developed Alzheimer's disease in their 80s, which is usually not the inherited form. Most of the inherited forms start before age 60. Not all, but most of the time. And if you're in the category where it's not strong early onset, 
where you probably don't have a mutation, but you just happen to have a parent who developed the disease, um, you don't yet have to have any formal testing done because we wouldn't do anything as of yet. Um, but as soon as you start having memory and cognitive impairments, come in and have a conversation about it. The discussion generally centers around what are you trying to accomplish? I'll explain to you what's out there and what may be helpful or what may not be helpful to you. And I, what I usually find is most people don't want to do a lot of expensive testing if there's nothing they can do about it, which has historically been the case and is still the case now. We wouldn't suddenly start using aducanumab in someone who has no significant impairment, even if we had a test, for example, that showed you had ApoE4, the two bad forms, the ApoE4 on both genes, there would not be an indication to start you on a therapy. But that doesn't mean there never will be. So it's an era of education, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about the genetic aspect. If it's strongly inherited, onset before 60, or people who are getting in their 40s and 50s, then a lot of people want to have the genetic testing done because you probably carry one of the genetic mutations. And that's, again, a very personal decision. Some people say, I want to know. It will help me plan for the future. Others say, I don't care to know that. So it becomes a very detailed discussion and sometimes involving a genetic counselor. But think about the opportunities in research, and many times that's where it goes. If you have a positive test, we may get you to the university and say, are these patients eligible for a clinical research study or early availability of certain therapies? Dr. Zacharias, thank you for tonight. Yeah, it was my pleasure. very helpful. Thanks. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.